Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Royal Society of Victoria. My name is David Zerman, and I have the great pleasure of being the 71st president of the Royal Society of Victoria, which was established in 1865. Okay, 1864, 54, just testing to see. I want to see if anyone's paying attention, other than the chief executive officer, 1854. We are gathered on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge our first scientists, the Wurundjeri to our north and the Boonarong to our south. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and likewise extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us here tonight. A warm Womanjika and a happy National Science Week to you all. Now, on to tonight's meeting, or as Mike always says, the main event for tonight. Our talk tonight features two separate speakers from two different universities presenting their remarkable work on the gut biome. People with autism often suffer from gut problems, but nobody, no, but nobody has known why the work of Associate Professor Eliza, Eliza Hill-Yardin and Ashley Franks has discovered the same gene mutations found both in the brain and the gut could be the cause. I'd like to invite Eliza, first of all, to come forward. And she knows she's doing this, as does Ashley. We're going to have a bit of a chat. So being an inquisitive person, I'm always interested in, um, first of all, where our speakers went to school, what they did in their education, etc. So where'd you go to school? <laughs> And this is the primary school? I started with primary school, Primary yes. school, okay. He, he, already, he already warned me about this. MacArthur Primary School. Now, for those of you who uh, know the Western District, it's been in between Port Ferry and Hamilton, and it was the most boring town in Victoria in the 1980s. Anyone remember that? Um, then I went to Hamilton High School for a couple of years, and then I went to Geelong Grammar School. And where did you go after that? Melbourne University. And what did you study? I did a science degree, uh, majoring in physiology, and why did you choose physiology? Um, I've always been interested in the brain and how the, understanding how the body works. Right. And your postgraduate work? So I did uh, some postgraduate training in Paris, in France. It was a lovely time. <laughs> um, doing electrophysiology uh, recording from brain cells. And then I did another uh, postdoctoral training period at the Hal Florey Institute studying epilepsy. And you did your PhD at the University of Melbourne? I did. It was in three places. It was Department of Optometry, University of Melbourne, it was Hal Florey Institute and the Department of Anatomy. So tell me, during your career leading up to tonight, did you have an aha moment at any stage and thought, wow, I really want to do this or gee, I never knew about that? Not really, but I did make a brain out of blue tack <laughs> when I was in year nine. So I think that was the turning point. I think we could all agree that that was yeah, the turning, turning point. point. And was there a teacher who encouraged you to make the blue tack brain? There was certainly a teacher. Hmm. I don't remember which one that yeah. was. Sorry. That's okay. Fine. If you'd just like to take a seat over there for a second. And Ashley, would you be prepared to undergo the same mastermind questions. Um, so where did you go to school? So I'm a born in Coonabarabran, so I'm a Coonabarabarian. People in Melbourne are more likely to know where that is than people in Sydney, because you go there when you go into Brisbane. Um, I then grew up in Kelso, so I went to Kelso Primary, then Kelso High. Um, then I went to university at the University of New South Wales, because my sister and my brother were at the University of Sydney, so I didn't want to go to the same place they were. Um, Science is my dad was actually an English teacher, so I went into science. So I, got, I got sick of the writing, which is amusing because I just actually wrote a paper on microbiology with a literature person, a literature conference. Um, but then after my um, undergrad and PhD, I did in marine microbiology. Then I went to Exeter in the UK where I did some work on um, biofilms and how bacteria can stick to a surface. 
Then I got a fellowship to work in Ireland where I looked at sugar beet and how it can actually um, interact with the microbiology in the soil to actually grow better and how you can get sort of better responses. And then I worked in, got recruited to go across to America where I worked in Amherst outside of Boston where we looked at bacteria that sort of used metals and stuff to eat and breathe. Was there a particular event, activity or teacher, lecturer who really encouraged you in any particular way? Yeah, I think I've been lucky. So there's been quite a few where um, at high school, a hand strove, who was really quite, quite keen and sort of they were innovative. We were a small school, but always he took the time and effort to actually help people in all the maths competition. So we always sort of ext went extremely well, that I think everyone was suspicious of us, but we went quite good. Um, <laughs> In Ireland, we actually worked out the sugar beet con could control the transcription of the microbes through chemical signals. So we all thought we were like really sort of clever, but the plants had already been doing this. <laughs> and then in um, America, where we found out that bacteria could eat and breathe electricity. So they already set up their own conduct conductive networks, which then led to the stuff with Elisa in the gut. And for me, it sort of seems like fun. Great. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Elisa and Ashley to address us tonight. Thank you very much indeed. So thanks very much for the invitation to speak. It's a real pleasure to be here and it's great to be able to talk about mind over fecal matter and the gut biome and mental health tonight. So tonight we're gonna to divide up the event into four different parts. <coughs> And you're going to hear a bit from me, you're going to hear from Ashley, you're going to hear from me and Ashley again at the end. So I'm first going to talk about the second brain. So by now you've probably figured out that I'm talking about the brain that we carry around in our gut. I'm then going to hand over to Ashley and he's going to tell you about all things small and microbial. I'm going to come back to me and we're going to talk about how we study the gut in autism, in mouse models. And then Ashley will wrap up and tell us, tell us what that means in terms of microbe changes in autism as well. So my research group and I are really interested in understanding how neurons communicate. And we're interested in this region here, the synapse, the joining point between neurons, where there are thousands of proteins. And these proteins are acting like the Velcro of the nervous system, keeping the neurons in close contact. So we want to understand how this works in normal situations, not just in the brain, but in disease and in the second brain in the gut. And so we're interested in brain wiring and in the gut, we're interested in gut health, and overarchingly in the lab, we wanna know how the nervous system interacts with bacteria. It's actually a really um, well-established concept, and I'd have to say that some of the researchers in Australia are the pioneers in this area, and so there's some great research being done right here in Melbourne by people like Professor John Furness and Professor Joel Bornstein, who really first mapped out the neurons in terms of their function and their neurochemicals. But it, it is well-established. It's just um, perhaps escaped people who've focused mainly on the, on the, um, the main brain um, in more recent years. What I think is new is this idea um, that we might change the brain in certain disorders and that might also have an effect on the gut. That's a new concept. So most of you will be familiar with this type of nervous system where you chop open a bit of brain and you can see these beautifully arranged neurons stained here for different fluorescent labels in the cerebral cortex. But you might not be so familiar with this one. And this is the enteric nervous system of the gastrointestinal tract. And it looks really different. You can see that the neurons are arranged in a mesh-like uh, arrangement. And these are plexuses, and there's two of them. They go all the way along the gut tube in between layers of muscle. Now, they look different, but they're actually more similar than what you might think. The cell bodies are here in red in these clumps called ganglia, and they talk to each other via these processes, these green processes on the muscle bed. Now, many of the neurochemicals that are found in the gut are, all, are the same as the ones found in the brain. And we also know that there are genes expressed in the brain. Most of the genes expressed in the brain are expressed in the gut as well. So here's a bit more of a detailed view of what that enteric nervous system looks like. A bit of a gory diagram. Here we are in the uh, lumen, and this is the small intestine. You see these finger-like villi pointing into the lumen. That's outside of our body, and the bacteria will be around here in bits of undigested food. You see muscle layers pulled apart here, and these yellow bits with the brown blobs, these are the neurons that you just saw in this image up here. 
So there are two different layers, as I mentioned before, the myenteric plexus, which is mainly concerned with the contractions of the gut and the motility, propelling the food from one end to the other, and the submucosal plexus over here, and that's involved in secretion and probably regulating um, the permeability of the gut. As I said before, it's a complex nervous system. There's actually 500 million neurons here in the gut. That's about the same number as what's in the spinal cord, astonishingly. And a great thing about working with the gut, it can function independently of our main brain. And so that, that's something we take advantage of in our experiments. So we work on the gut-brain axis. We're really interested in understanding how this brain talks to this brain and vice versa. We realise now that um, when we're healthy, our gut's uh, doing what it should, we've got uh, the right balance of bacteria and our brain's working fine as well. But what we're noticing is that with a lot of these neurological disorders, you think about what you've read about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and, and a whole host of other disorders, we're finding there are gut symptoms uh, popping up in these disorders as well. And then we look closely and we see that uh, with abnormal gut sim symptoms, we often get an imbalance of bacteria, also known as dysbiosis, and we get changes in our mood and behaviour and how our um, main brain is working. So my lab's really approaching uh, studying this by using genetics and looking at how that synapse might be altered. But what Ashley's going to tell you about is all of these colourful, quirky things, the microbes, and how that fits into this circle. So, you know, with a bit of resistance, we've realised we can't just study the gut and the nervous system on its own. We've got to talk to people like Ashley who understand about the microbes. And we do this because we know the microbes are integral to this circuit and help the gut and brain communicate and affect our mood and behaviour. I think only recently too, with a lot of the modern techniques that we have, can we really go through and sort of understand this as a, at a really such a small level? Because I suppose with the enteric nervous system, it's being a mesh. But then having things like patch clamping or having things like single cell sequencing, you know, or the DNA technology, so you can go through and look at the action of an individual neuron or what's occurring. It's not, you, had, you didn't have to mush everything up and sort of get an average. You can actually go through and, and do that precise individual genes, complete genomes, the human genomes being mouse genomes have all been sequenced, so then you can map back all your RNA, you can map back all your proteins, and you can look at all these pathways and those very complex interactions. So I think... Yeah, people have known about it for a long time, but with the ability to get really into it, it's only quite, quite, no, quite, quite new. So we think studying these kind of things are going to be useful for a whole host of neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder or just autism. So this is a really common disorder and I'm sure that everyone sitting here knows someone who has autism or at least has family friends who, who have a member who has autism. So the latest figures from the US say that one in 59 school-aged kids are diagnosed with autism. So to be diagnosed with autism, it's a pretty long, drawn-out uh, procedure. You've got to have a lot of psychology hours and clinical um, tests and so on. It's based on behaviour. And you must have um, impaired social communication alongside repetitive and restricted and or restricted behaviours. So that's all right. We all have a little bit of a bit of those kind of characteristics maybe but it's really important to know that you've got to have these traits and they have to be uh, severe enough to impact daily life and so that's how you get di diagnosed with autism. So you probably knew a fair bit of that. What you might not know is that autism comes in a whole host of flavours, you know different severities, different types of um, comorbid traits that um, people with autism are dealing with as well. So we've looked um, in mouse models at some of the behaviours that are really common um, and we're very focused at the moment on gastrointestinal symptoms. Another thing that's coming up both in patient literature and in the, in the animal model world is this idea of neuroimmune immune changes and that's where the nervous system is somehow uh, changing and interacting with the immune system and we think that that's probably going to involve bacteria as well. What we're discovering with autism is that it is actually groups of mutations. So autism as we see it, or have been sort of diagnosing, is, is due to the actions of the individual. We look for these outcomes of it, which could be caused by a number of different mutations. So in the future, I think autism is going to then be subdivided into different classes based on different, different mutations. So although we don't have a simple test for autism, it's, it's diagnosed behaviourally, there's a huge impact of genetics. A recent study came out 
and said that about 80% of the influence of um, autism is genetic based. So we know now there's over a thousand gene mutations um, associated with autism in patients. So it's, it's a complex field. The problem is, is that these mutations are rare, so you don't get very many people with autism with the same mutation, so it's difficult to study. But what we can do is group those mutations based on what they do. And there's a whole bunch of them, nearly 200 or so, that are actually involved in our favorite part of the nervous system, the synapse. So here's a diagram here with one neuron, it's in a yellow color, pointing down on the top of the screen, and here's another neuron heading off down this way, and this is the synapse. And you'll see all these different shapes here, these are proteins, and a lot of them are highlighted in red. And these genes encoding these proteins have already been associated with autism in patients. So we can see a very nice pattern here, and it tells us even small mutations in, these, in one of these molecules has got a big effect on brain wiring and can cause autism. So we've got a favorite gene. Our favorite gene is in this family, the neuroligans. We're particularly interested in a single point mutation, which means that only one base is changed in the DNA sequence. And it's in a gene called neuroligin 3, and it's a missense mutation. It changes an arginine to a cysteine. So it's neuroligin 3, R451C. It's a mouthful, but you'll see it later on in the talk and you'll know what it means. So genetics are important, and that's why we try and study them in genetic mouse models. So what we do is we take these rare human mutations, we put them into mice, and so they're our autism mice. Now, this particular um, mouse model of autism is very well characterized, and it actually shows traits that are relevant to autism. So the important thing about studying mice is different to people. We can make mice genetically identical. We breed them many generations, so every mouse that we study is like an identical twin, except some of them have got this mutation. So we know that if any of those mice are different, the ones with the mutation, it's due to the mutation. It's not due to the food, it's not due to the, due to the environment or their genetics. All of that's the same. So these mice have impaired social interaction. They don't talk, they don't hang out with each other as much as like normal mice. They don't talk to each other as much when we record their uh, ultrasonic vocalizations. And they've got repetitive or restrictive behaviors in, in the way they groom or visit um, different novel objects in their cage. So these are a great model to have a look at that um, enteric nervous system and see what happens when we um, have this uh, human gene mutation. So, of course, one of the next questions is we want to know what happens to the neurons in the gut in, the, in autism. Even the concept that um, the genetics are involved in autism is relatively recent. So you will remember that up until I think the 1970s, it was thought to be um, a psychological or behavioural based disorder and that was due to um, incorrect parenting, if you like. That's not the case. That's absolutely not the case. So it's really been a breakthrough looking at the genetic influence. So where we are now, we have great techniques, but we still don't have all the information. We can scan for panels of um, copy number variations. Do you have too much of a gene? Do you have too little? We can scan for panels of known uh, SNPs or single nucleide um, polymorph polymorphisms, but it's not enough because we're not capturing all the information yet. So the simple answer is no, we can't do a simple genetic test, but we do have a lot more information about genetics than we used to. When we start talking about the gut, the one thing we need to actually start talking about is actually microbes in the gut. Because your gut is an organ that is actually made up mostly of microbes. And microbes, as I'm sure you've all sort of heard about, a lot of people see the bad start of stuff of microbes, but 99.9% .9 of the microbes are doing things that are beneficial. So just relative size, this is a head of a pin. We're talking about microbes at about one micrometer in length. So that's a millionth of a meter. So they're very tiny, very small. You probably know about them in your shower if you don't clean it properly but they grow and they are actually very fast at growing. They can grow every 20 minutes, they can divide and multiply. But all through your gut, we've actually evolved to actually have a range of different bacteria that carry out a huge range of different functions for us. So we need microbes. If you're on antibiotics for too long, you get diarrhea and you're not that well. Microbes, mostly we need. There's an imbalance where things go wrong, where it can cause disease, but mostly they're actually quite beneficial for us and they stop disease from happening. Not only for us, but my interest is, because I'm an environmental microbiologist, is microbes are pretty much essential for everything. So 
They are the foundation of our soil. When you actually go after rain, you go out to those nice open fields and you can smell that good earth. That's microbe you're smelling. The actual communities go through and do a whole bunch of dynamics. There's everything that's going on. Our world is based on microbial actions. They were around for several billion years where they prepared, prepared the earth for us. They actually produced all our oxygen. We've been around for a very short amount of time and taking great advantage of them. One of the things for me when I first started this work with Elisa is I had a very basic understanding of mammals. So I saw nutrients came in. We were pretty much a sort of warm fleshy tube that actually maintained a microbial population which we could collect samples from the other end. <laughs> I've been convinced that we're a bit more complex than this, but there's still a strong argument that we've actually been evolved by the bacteria to find them things that they need. Aggression, anxiety, these are all sort of behaviours which you can, could imagine would be give a heightened sense for evolution and survival. If you actually have a host, you want that host to survive to find you more food, so if they're more anxious, they're always more looking for more predators. If they're more aggressive, they can get more food. And these sort of behaviours, which the human sort of race has been chosen for anyway, is heightened and actually pushed. And basically they then become dominant and then they become better carriers and vehicles for actually the microbes in them. So we're more than just us. Microbes are essential for our food digestion. They're actually a source of vitamins, amino acids, fatty acids. We can't actually produce all the things we need ourselves. We need the microbes to produce vitamins for us. We actually, a lot of people are taking supplements, but the microbes have been doing that for many millions of years already. A healthy microbe will actually prevent dis disease. They'll dis displace disease. They will prevent disease from coming in. O often the actual disease is just opportunistic. Also in our microbiome, even though the microbes are so small, the genetic potential of genes and pathways and things can happen is a lot big, bigger than the human host. So they extensively interact with us, they interact with the environment. It's actually a big sort of situation back and forth. All our microbiomes, because we've been here for an hour to, tonight together, are slightly more like each other's than before. And there's a lot of interaction back and forth with the environment. But when I talk about bacteria, the, re the way that I talk about things is operational taxonomic unit. This is just how we group and name bacteria. So in this tree of life, very hard to see. Humans are about here. Plants, and, oh sorry, fungus are just next to them. Plants are just here. This is the genetic diversity of bacteria. So we have to find a way to lump all of that together. So between me and my brother, we're pretty identical with our actual genetics. He's a redhead. So I'd say his genetics might be 99% similar to an orangutan. <laughs> also very similar to a chimpanzee. So we, sort of, we have that type of definition with, you know, once it gets personal. But with the bacteria, if their genetics are 97% um, similar, we'll say they're the same thing. So we've got this type of very big group lumping them. And we talk about them actually at different levels. So we talk about family, species, I'll talk about phylums. But this is just lumping an operational taxonomic unit if you're talking about dogs or a bulldog or a French bulldog. It's just a way of splitting everything up as you go down. Just because your actually data gets so large and gets so big, you have to find ways to make it sort of um, work for us. But we use this because what we can do is we can talk about, when we start to compare things, how many bacteria are, are there? Are those different operational taxonomic units, are they equal? Are there ones that disappear? Are there ones that go? We do things what we call fingerprinting, which is looking at the microbiome to look at the patterns of the OTUs, how they come and go. We actually do a lot of stuff which is just not just naming them. But everyone loves names, so sometimes we put names in. But the thing with names sometimes is they don't tell you the whole story. I'll say to my undergrads, there's a big difference between Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis. One of them is going to be very difficult to pee for a little bit. The other one you need to, to get to hospital in three hours or you'll die. So that type of naming and definition depends on what level it is. It tells you some information, but it doesn't tell you anything. And while our, uh, while our microbiome is all very similar, we also have a large amount of genetic variability. So what this graph is, is this is 1,100 people. They're all about the same age. 
This is actually the breakup of Firmicutes, um, Antibacter, Bacteroides. These are the main ones. But these is when you can actually go back and forth and you can see that spread over a population. So when we start to talk about things about what's a good population or what's a bad one, it gets very sort of complex and you have to look at a number of different factors. Because one of the factors that we can actually look at is age and the environment. So this is again just showing graph to show you how the actual microbiome is actually split up. We know as you go from a baby to a toddler to an adult to elderly, um, your actual microbiome will go through and change. This is a change with your body, with its interaction, with the food that you eat, with the environment that you live in. We know that if you're actually under heavy antibiotic treatments, it will change it. If it's um, malnutrition, it will change it. If you're obese, your actual microbiome is different as well. If you take a microbiome from an obese person and put it into a skinny person, the skinny person will start putting on weight. If you actually take it from a skinny person and put it in an obese person, they will lose far weight faster on a diet. So there's a lot of these interactions back and forth about all these things that are going on. It's, as Elisa said, been essential because it interacts with our immune system. It's actually essential for our life. And the funny thing for us is that it was always considered that you were born sterile. But it's nice being in a sort of science society because evolution doesn't leave things to chance. So you don't get sort of born through your sort of many millions of years of evolution and it hopes you lick the right thing to get the right microbes to make sure everything works. Because what I'll talk about here is just on a little side tangent is some of the work that we're doing now and about to publish is to show that actually the microbes are so important that they're actually there before birth. You're not sterile in the womb. We do all this work in calves because it's not really sort of good to try and do this type of research on humans. <laughs> And also with calves, part of the actual, with cows, part of the actual abattoir process, you can get a hold of fetuses from untouched uteruses, which are actually otherwise a waste product of that system. And what you can actually easily do is measuring the length will tell you how many months gestation this is. So these are all different groups we're working with. Normally it's a nine month gestation period. The actual cows can be a good model for the human, even though it's got a room and it's a bit slightly different, but the development interactions, nervous systems. So what we're able to do with these groups is actually get these cows at the different one. We actually remove their actual um, digestive systems. And we could actually go and separate all of these test t tissue and fluid of those, because when you're actually in the womb, you'll actually be... Um, you'll be actually moving and there's actually um, embryonic fluid will be moving through your gut. And what we could actually see is in utero, each of those points actually had its own microbiome. It was different to the actual microbiome of the fluid and there was a difference between the tissue or the ones associated with it and the, and the liquid going through. So with this work looking through it, we could see that there's bacteria and archaea were there before birth. There was only 245 OTUs. Normally in your gut microbe, uh, in your microbiome, there's more than 1,000. There were 16 archaeal. We know bacteria and archaea are both really important. And there were no fungal species at all that we detected in this. Part of this work, though, is that, as you can probably guess, it is quite actually messy in the rest. So we had to do more controls than actual experimental procedures to go back and show this. We could show that the difference between the flu and the tissues was being selected for. It was actually seemed to be programmed and it was consistent across the different calves at different times. And that development as well from three to four to seven months, that was consistent when we're looking at different species. Looking at the most abundant ones too, we could see protobacteria, bacteroides, firmicutes. These are ones that people quite often will find in our actual uh, microbiome of ourselves that we see as beneficial microbes. One thing we did too was actually take these microbes from the gut and actually then go through and grow them up. Because that's one of the big things when you're working with these type of thing, everyone says, but is it actually alive? You can detect it, but it may actually just be a food source, it may be contamination. We could grow and show it. So this is us just going on with the calves. Is, this is just to show even before birth, there's a programmed way of actual your gut and microbiome and body interacting. So not only is this really important 
for our development, but it's actually the development of our neurons, our immune system and the rest. But this is how the two are actually really well interacted with each other. So with that, then we'll start to talk to you about studying the gut in autism. If you're going to use a model, you want to have uh, a simple question as possible. So we have this point mutation, we know where it is, and then we can explore what happens. So that makes a nice model for us to understand the nervous system. There are lots of other models out there that are genetics-based, so you know we could look at some of the perhaps Parkinson's models, we could look at a, at a whole host of other things that are available, and we do do that. We collaborate with other labs. Any model that's available, we also look at the gut as well. Now I want to show you what we've been doing in the mouse gut. So we've got a number of techniques that we can use, and one of the really nice ones is this x-ray technique. Now, the mice are live, and it's kind of enjoyable for them. They get to make a new friend when they do this experiment. They meet someone like this. This is a syringe, and it goes in their cage the, the night before. They become friends with it, and then the morning afterwards, um, when they're about to have their x-rays, we hold them by the tail and they're very happy to go inside and sit inside this um, syringe for a short time while we take these images. So we feed them something first, barium sulfate, and you can see that here, it shows up nicely on the x-ray. Now you'll see around the edges there, they're sitting in the syringe. So we do this over several hours and we can follow how long it takes them to generate their fecal pellets. Very exciting science. <laughs> now that's all very well and good, but the brain's attached in that experiment, so we know the brain and the gut talk, and so that could be influencing any change in the gut that we see. So we need to have experiments where we can isolate the gut and look at what it's doing. Remember, it works independently as well. So we have a nice setup where we can take a bit of gut, put it in some warm saline, and we have a nice computer program that can convert it and tell us what the gut contractions are, are like, and that's a very good assay. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a sec. We can also zoom in, look at those gut neurons in our own mouse preparations, and we can have a look at the mucosal barrier structure as well. It's got a really important role. It's there really to keep the microbes outside of us, that's inside the gut tube, outside of us, and away from the nervous system and the, and, uh, the bloodstream. So we can do all that. And of course, Ashley will fill you in on how to analyze these kind of samples in the last part of the talk. So I want to show you a little bit from those x-ray experiments with the mice that are so happy to jump inside their friend, the syringe. So here we go. We've got some examples, and these are normal mice or control mice, and you can see they've had a good dose of barium sulfate. Um, now at time zero and time five minutes, and we've got an hour, and we've got another image here at, um, what have we got, 100, uh, an hour and 40 minutes, and then a bit over two hours. And lo and behold, look at this red arrow, one of them's produced a brightly coloured palette. So that's good. What we can do with this x-ray is we can follow from the stomach all the way along the different parts of the gut, so along the small intestine, over to the cecum, um, which is a, a very large um, part of the gut and it's like the appendix in the mice, and along the, the large intestine or the colon. So of course we've compared this in the autism model, and down here we've got an example, and you can see that the palettes, there's two of them here, before any of the pellets were produced in the, in the control animal. So we looked at a bunch of animals together and we found this held when we looked at a group and the autism mice were able to create um, past feces much quicker than the controls. So we thought, wow, this is interesting. Maybe they've got a problem with their gut. But of course we have to test that without the brain attached. So I want you to just focus on this right panel. This is a mouse colon that's just freshly been dissected and you pop it into this warm saline and just tie the ends of it to a tube and you see these beautiful, spontaneous and regular contractions starting from the oral end, proceeding down to the distal end of the colon. And you see this content in here? Guess what it is? Microbes. And you'll see a bit of it flush back here and you're getting some relaxation up this end as well. So these mouse colons will do this for more than three hours. It's a fantastic assay for us we know that it's regulated by the nervous system. We can add drugs to block the neuron activity and those contractions stop. We can also add drugs that modify neurons and the patterns change. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about this in the next slide, but just briefly, elsewhere in the gut, 
here you see these really bizarre complex patterns and this is what the small intestine is doing, mixing up our food and digesting and so on. So we're finding ways to analyse and quantify this kind of activity as well. So here we are again, this is our setup. We have a very simple video camera, just a webcam basically, heading back to the computer and we have some really great software that we work with software engineers um, to be able to code the videos um, by their contractions into these red stripes or spatiotemporal maps where each of those red stripes is one of those nice long contractions that you saw in the last video. So we can look at this pattern um, either without drugs or with different drugs and see what's happening. So of course we've done this in control mice and we've done it in the mice that have the human autism mutation. So firstly along the top these are the control mice and these examples, these are our best examples, we always say they're representative, these are our best, um, of our autism mice and down here the group data. So when we don't add drugs and we just look at those contractions in the bath, there's absolutely no difference. It was a little bit disappointing. But then what we did is we added a drug by Cuculin that we know acts on a receptor on a lot of neurons, the GABA-A receptor, and we saw no change in the control animals but we saw reduced numbers of those contractions in the autism mice and that's shown down here. We then tried another drug which is even more specific for that same receptor, gabazine, and we saw a slight reduction in the number of contractions in the control animals, but look at this, it almost wiped out the contractions in the autism model. So that tells us there's something happening in the nervous system in the gut in these mice due to that human mutation that causes autism in people. So the next question is we want to know which of the neurons are involved. Are the neuron populations changed when that mutation is present? So we can look at all different regions of the gut, the small intestine here from the stomach over to the cecum and the colon here. And we're starting to find that the small intestine seems to be more susceptible to these kind of mutations. So we looked in the small intestine and here's an image from the jejunum. And we found more neurons were present in the autism mice in the myenteric plexus. Remember, this is the plexus that is more involved in the motility, those contractions that you just saw. Then we looked also in the submucosal plexus and we found changes in the neuron populations there as well. So remember, that plexus is more involved in things like secretion and it might be involved in making sure that um, mucosal barrier is sealed tight. We're looking at um, uh, the barrier function um, in the gut and looking to see what the neuronal circuitry is behind that and I think that's exciting. There are other people looking at that in different um, diseases as well. I think what where we'd like to go um, is seeing how we can modify behaviour by targeting in a very clever way uh, components of the microbial population and that's what we'd like to go forward and look at yep. as well. I think also on the other side is building a catalogue or a, a view across different disorders, are we seeing the same thing in models of different diseases, of neurological disorders in terms of the gut function and the microbial changes, or are we seeing different things? And I think that's a really exciting thing to do as well. We have the tools to be able to compare across a whole range of things, and that might have implications for the clinic. That's one of the main functions of the gut really, isn't it? To keep the bacteria out, and keep it away from the bloodstream, the nervous system and so on. So we thought, let's have a look and see if that's changed. It's also important for a lot of these brain disorders, we know that bacteria can somehow influence our brain by a number of pathways. So we had a look at our control mice and you can see this is a bit of small intestine cut uh, trans in the transverse section and these villi are in good shape. You can see them clearly defined pointing into the lumen and then you have a look at an example from one of our autism mice and the villi look very fragile and they look like they've got gaps and they're falling apart. So we thought we'd better have a look at this. Have we got a leaky gut? So when we, if we want to test whether the mucosa is leaky, it's pretty simple. You grab a bit of mouse gut, you stretch it across this very high-tech piece of equipment and we call it an Ussing chamber and you can assess how many particles can cross across that mucosal piece of tissue. So we use this um, apparatus, so our tissue will be here, and you've got the chamber here, and another chamber here, and you basically put some um, fluorescent molecules in here, and you can measure how many get across onto the other side. And we did that, 
And we did it in a whole lot of areas along the gut, in our control mice and our autism mice. And we found these are supposed to be holes to make it look like it's porous. We found that the ileum was particularly susceptible um, to a decrease in the um, mucosal perme um, increased mucosal permeability. So we found that we got more of those molecules crossing across that bit of tissue when it was from the ileum in the autism mice. So it looks like we've got a leaky gut phenotype in the autism mice due to that nervous system mutation identified in humans. So a quick summary of what I've just shown you. We've, we know that gut changes are common in autism. Um, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but yeah, you're much more likely to be hospitalized for gastrointestinal problems if you have autism compared to the general population. And we know that many genes associated with autism affect neuronal wiring in the brain. And so we therefore propose that it's also affecting neuronal wiring in the gut. And we've shown you that our autism mice have altered contractions in the gut. They have more neurons in some parts of the gut. And we think they've got um, what you might say is a leaky gut phenotype in some regions. So I want to hand back to Ashley to tell us what that might mean when we think about the microbial populations. Yeah, so this is just going back to one that the microbes we know have evolved with us or have evolved us for their benefit. Um, and we know there's actual interactions back where you've got a local effect on the gut. You've actually got communications to the brain. There's metabolism going on that feeds us and keeps us happy. So between the microbes and us, there's been a long series of evolution back and forth. And so what we were actually one time when me and Elisa probably met about six or seven years ago, we may have actually been undertaking some microbial fermented products, having a discussion one night and um, talking about this actual her work and my work. And my work was actually then in mainly soils. And as I said to you before, I always saw that from an eco a microbial ecologist's point of view. She was talking about this single point uh, mutation in neurologin in the brain. Thought it seemed like a good idea. We actually talked about and discussed it um, more when we actually, probably the next day when the sun was up. Um, and what we did there was thinking, okay, well, there is a potential. We know there's actually evidence towards a microbiome and there's this point mutation in the brain. How can we show that there is an actual difference? We need to do this properly if we're going to do it because it's got big ramifications. So we set up an experiment where we actually got mice and we got the actual mutant mice that um, Elisa was working with and she had done a lot of work with and the wild type mice. So those are genetically identical except for one point mutation in the brain. So the whole genomes are identical except for one base pair. In this actually two sets of mice, we thought, well, there's environmental differences we know. So what we'll actually do is actually mix them up. Of course, we know mice, you know, being mice are coprophiliac. They like to eat, eat each other's poo. They like to do other things, scratch each other. So we'll actually put them in the cages together. So they're growing up together. There's a mix of the genotypes. There's the mutant mice and the wild type mice together. Their food's the same. Their environment's the same. And everything about it is the same except for this one point mutation. So expecting to see nothing, we went on and had a look, and this is actually looking at the populations of the actual microbes in those using these coordinations. So this is looking at doing statistics to look at all the mice and looking at the actual population, all those OTUs, looking at the number, looking at the percentages and the rest. And what we actually noticed here was that at five weeks, there was actually a clear difference between these two populations. So even though they're living together, even though they're eating each other's feces, even though they're actually, you know, spending all their time together, there's nowhere else to go, they're in the cage, um, their, micro, their populations were still different. And this was actually quite surprising to us at that time because there's a single point mutation in the brain causing a difference to the microbes in the gut. And there were still arguments going around this stage is how much of an interaction does that actually occur? By the nine weeks of age, this difference and clear one, those two actually had come back together. So it wasn't as clear a difference as they grew older. So when they were actually younger and when they were in the actually more juvenile stage, they were actually had a big difference. By the time they were actually older, and this is more um, sort of post sort of infantile, they were nine weeks of age, they are more sort of juvenile mice, more, t more teenagers causing trouble, um, there was this difference. So the one thing for us then is we want to go through and have a look at this in more detail. So what we could see is that at the overall number of OTUs, there wasn't a statistical difference in their total number. So this is looking at everything together. 
when we actually go through to the phylum level, what we could actually see at the phylum level, there was no statistical differences either. So it wasn't a real surprise of us. The same ones there, they had the same microbes. There was going to be a mix of those similar phylum. So going through in more depth and trying to do some analysis, what we could actually see is there were some actually unique taxonomic units between these two different mutant and wild type mice. So there's 11 that was always found in all the mice at week five, but there was 12 that was only found ever in the wild type and never in the mutant. And there were six of these OTUs that were only ever found in the mutant mouse and never found in the wild type. By the time you got to the nine weeks of age, these has actually had sort of separated down. So this was actually seemed to be saying then that through this actual communication with the brain and this actually into in the neuroligon, that there was actually a controlling which microbes on that type of specific level were actually interacting with the gut. We're interested in trying to see what some of these were. And lo and behold, there were some that were things like the lactobacilli, which are um, residents and in the human body. They were sort of well known to be part of breast milk and the rest. If you look at this is the change that normally happens between the wild type at five weeks and nine weeks, you get a different change that is occurring between those. So even though these ones actually may seem, uh, appear to start off similar, and they've got those different populations, those populations developing back together to look like each other cause changes at different rates. Similar when you actually look at the um, Bacteroides, what you'll actually see in the Bacteroides here is even though these ones, are, so these ones increase and these ones reduce, this one doesn't happen with this um, mutation. And we know the Bacteroides, we know the Firmicutes, we know these ones are actually quite important for the actual microbiome. So the thing that we're interested in is, that, well, what is this importance, what does it mean? So at the moment, as I've been saying, we've been giving lots of names, lots of the microbes. Quite often it's not the microbes that are important, but the functions they carry out. So lots of people would like to live in a town with no lawyers because I think that would be nicer. But if you've got a bunch of barristers and solicitors anyway, then you're going to have the same fact function that's actually occurring. And same with these microbes, what we're interested in is because just because we had different microbes there, what did that mean overall to that whole ecology and ecosystem function? And so we do this by looking at the physiology profiling. What we did was actually use this assay where there's a whole bunch of different carbon sources so these are the different carbon sources the microbes would eat. These are the ones that would they break down and give us different products. And what this assay does is basically as the microbes can use it, they'll go through and make a pink or a purpley colour just because of the chemical reaction of them growing. This one is done at the community scale, so we basically just mix it up with all the poo and we see what everything can do together. So at this stage, the function is a sum of the entire microbial community. And what we actually found that substrate um, utilisation to begin with it was highest at five weeks of age and was less at nine weeks. This is sort of partly to a maturing of your immune system, maturing of your microbiome. It's something that we actually normally expect because as things sort of come into whack and, and work and your body is actually going through and drive that development, then what's happening is that it's selecting out the microbes that are the most beneficial for you. The interesting thing that we found was even though the microbial populations were different at five weeks of age, their functional group, functional ones were still similar. So it's an interesting one. There was different bacteria carrying out some similar functions when you just look at carbohydrate utilisation. But at nine weeks of age, even though those two populations began to be more like each other, a carryover effect from that change early on meant that you actually had a different in your carbon utilisation. So even though then after nine weeks you had the, same micro, had the same populations, their functions are now quite different. So it's an ongoing one then, and our question is to start to look at these type of things in more detail is, well, you're more than a sum of your parts, your, your function is very important, what your metabolites, what does this mean for signalling back and forth across your gut to your brain and the rest? Some of the things we're actually doing this with is then this spatial mapping of the microbiome. So as Elisa showed you, it is a long big tube, there's lots of faeces that go along with it. These microbes we were collecting at the end. But what we can actually start to do is use fluorescent probes, what we have here, to target individual microbes. 
So we know the bifidobacterium, the lactobacillus, all these ones, we can specifically make a probe to make them a specific colour and go back and look at where are they, where are they occurring, where are they interacting within that um, um, gastrointestinal system. And what does this mean along that whole thing? Does it actually come with where it's actually coming more or less, um, things are being more or less absorbed at more and higher rate? It's not just faeces, but along the length, looking at the actual functional ones, then going past bacteria into looking at the whole genomes, looking at the transcripts, RNA and DNA, but using that for the actual microbiome engineering. So how can we do as a whole system, change it? And that could be through pushing different ways through different drivers and even then actually moving into synthetic biology because if we know there are certain characteristics that are going to be really inter important for the actual interaction, can we develop microbes with those characteristics that actually then respond when needed in that situation? So with this one, what we're actually sort of finding with a lot of it was that the structure was different early on but the function is changed. There's specific amino acid functions that are changed within the microbiome as well. And this led to sort of functional changes that we're sort of doing now to go through and look at in more detail and sort of carry on with our, our work and processes. So we know now with this mouse model that there's an altered microbes is happening in autism. We know that microbes can actually change and influence behavior. So we're trying to work out then is can we actually change this type of ratio to be more benef benefit and modulate to improve health or quality of life. Because what we know from a lot of the ecological theory is that this is a big ecosystem, there's things that come and go, and can you do the pushes in the right way? So this is one thing that we're working on at the moment. This is, this is another part of the project that we're actually quite interested in. We have actually done work in cars before, because we're doing the work with the cows. A big problem with cows is when they eat grass, they chew it, but they'll produce methane. Cows are the biggest methane producer in Victoria, which is the largest producer of greenhouse gas. Also, too, loss in methane is a loss of um, energy for the cow. Using this ecological theory and the understanding that we have, just using food, food supplement, you can push that function to a way that reduces the methanogens, that will actually then reduce methane production, that will go through and actually increase your milk production slightly as well. So you're not getting methane, you're getting more acetate, the cows get that, and, and those ones go back and forth. We're also working with different groups as well, looking at polyclonal um, platforms. So what this will allow us to do is actually go through and identify those unique microbes. We can actually go through and select those out, we can grow them up, we can actually produce these um, polyclonal antibodies, which you can go through and then signal to the actual host that they shouldn't be there. So we can start to modulate either individuals in the microbiome, we can actually modulate functions in the microbiome, and it's not about going in and wiping everything out with an antibiotic, it's not about going through and actually destroying a whole part of that community, it's more like trying to engineer a town to actually go through and do slightly better functions or carry out tasks that we're more interested in. So this sort of wraps up our work with looking at a lot of these things that are going on within the gut and our autism. So we can see that the actual point mutation in the brain, so one base pair in the whole genome, will end up causing differences in aggression and repetition, but this leads to gut um, dismobility, permeability, there's differences in neurodevelopment, differences in the microbiome feeding back, you get the dysbiosis, and there's actually a, a feedback mechanism back and forth. So if you can actually go through and improve that, so improve the quality of life because you're getting reducing even just diarrhea or reducing the constipation, if you can reduce the aggression or the repetition through the modulation of the microbiome in this gut, it's not a cure, but it increases the quality of life for a lot of people associated with those type of studies. The work that we're doing could um, assist in those more emerging fields. Depression. Mm -hmm would be very much linked as well, um, anxiety. Maybe even something uh, like chronic fatigue, where we're looking you know, at that kind of thing. And then even just then back to the general population, there's like individuals dealing with situations of stress. Even through general ebbs and lows and stuff in people's general lives, they're not sick or have a, dessert, have a thing, but how does the microbiome respond? And how could you actually then help that with the general population health? That sort of comes into personalised medicine yeah. as well, which is another area that's really of interest. 
And then part of this too is when you're seeing a doctor is that part of your recovery or part of your health could be looking at your microbiome and its changes over a long term. With the techniques that are available now, we've also got the opportunity to go back and really characterise the different cell types that are in the gut as well. And that can give us more information about what's going wrong in these kind of disorders. And it hasn't been done. And that's somewhere we'd really like to go as well. Of course, with all of this, there's a lot of people who do it. These always takes very big teams. Um, Elisa is the one who's been driving a lot of this. I've been lucky to come along and sort of play around with the bacteria. But with that, I, everyone's too, there's too many people to call, call out and thank, but thank you to everyone for this. I think with that, me and Elisa are happy to take any questions if anyone's got any. So normally with questions, I start on one side and work around to try and get through one question from everyone. And as my friend Tony Jones says, we prefer a question rather than a comment. Okay, so let's start on this side over here. Any questions? Sandra, the gentleman next to her. Um, in, in changing the uh, microbiome or anything like that, it's going to be hard to do anything to the neurodevelopmental side of things, surely. I mean, that's not really going to change. I'm thinking in people with autism. That's hoping for a bit too much, isn't it? Right. There's a genetic mut mutation yes. there, and that's not going to change that. That's going to be, well, look, on the other side of things, we're looking at the neurons and we're looking at where, for example, the um, drugs are acting when we see those changes in contraction. So that's a whole other part of the project, to look at those drug targets and try and modulate the nervous system as well. But we do have maybe something, some area to play with, with the microbes, but not getting rid of that initial insult, which might be a genetic mutation. You're right. There, it's interestingly enough, there are, there are studies where people supplement with um, microbes and they show repair of those kind of, uh, of um, some of the gut leakiness and they show behavioural changes in, in rodent models. Yeah. But Ashley might add something to that too. No, I think, and, and like, as you're saying, with modulation with the microbiome, is that it's not, like I said, it's never going to be a cure. But if we know that there's a development in the womb and that can actually be, as we're saying, early in life, that early intervention can help modulate. If we can, act, we've just had a student who's gone through and look at the gene SNP mutations with autism, but there's also a big lineup with um, gene SNP mutations of gut dysfunction. So if you can then target your medicines for it, so you're not trialing different medicines over a long period of time to hope they work, you can count or discount certain ones. Um, but also with the gut leakiness is what we're finding now is that we're getting a whole bunch of different diseases that we're working in with other people and finding there's actually. So depression, um, anxiety, Parkinson's disease, wow. even um, hypertension, mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't realise it's in your colon is where you absorb all your water. There's a lot of microbes there. And hypertension is high blood pressure, which is absorbing a lot of the water. So there seems to be a sort of a microbial impact there. And the question a lot of the time comes back is which comes first, the microbes or the symptoms? Or is it the microbes, you have the symptoms, the microbes and cause an elevation of the symptoms? So... Still a lot of work to be done. Okay, the gentleman next to Sandra and then the gentleman at the end of that row. As well. Thank you. Um, you've been uh, talking about a connection between the, the brain and the heart brain, as you call it. Okay. The gut brain, sorry. Um, is there any work sort of intended to sort of connect to the heart brain as well as to the trilogy that goes on there? Well, you know, we've got a big lot of work ahead of us just to look at the gut brain and, and, and the main brain. But yes, yeah, certainly we do have um, people at La Trobe University who are very interested in the, in the heart as well and working with a whole host of animal models and people yeah. at the Baker. So um, we are, we're working with people who are, who are doing stroke. We are working with people who have hypertension. We're also doing working with people with diabetes because a lot of these and a lot of the things that we find in ours are applicable then to be actually go across and use and say, okay, it's a different, it's a different disease model, but from what we've learned, can we actually help them quickly step up and say, can they rule microbes in or out, or how do you look at it to modulate it? Because I'm just asking about gut disorders. Yep. Is it just connected to the, to the brain, or does the heart brain also have something to do with those disorders? Yeah, depending on the disorder, most likely. And it's one of those ones at the moment too, it's, it's one of those ones, if, you, if you're sick, your, your microbiome changes, 
but we have to do the work to make sure that the microbiome change is because of something of just not someone's not eating the same amount or someone some other factor so is it there a genetic or is there a you know it's not just an environmental influence uh, mine's a two-part question uh, the first is on the delivery to change the gut the bacteria composition would it be through supplementation or something like a fecal transplant and then after it's done how how, do, how are you sure that it would stick or would it just be an ongoing type of thing? So horses for courses, depending on what the need is. So sometimes there is transplants. The problem with the transplant, it will go back to what it was before. So sometimes you might get to three to six months, but someone with a, a chronic problem with their gut, that is actually a gold mine. Question then is, well, where, where, what is a good gut? What's a bad gut? A lot of this is about supplementation of understanding what the actual microbial community of an individual. A lot of this is actually going probably to personalised medicine. So you're going to actually have a lot of microbiome sequencing done. You're going to actually have a whole bunch of other physiological tests to look at, OK, how, how do we modulate this? One of the supplementation is useful. A lot of the microbes, though, it's green leafy vegetables and a healthy diet gives you the best outcome. But it's not that easy with a population, otherwise we wouldn't have heart disease and other, other things associated with it. Thank you. Next row, going further up on that side. Anyone going up? Up. Yes. Anyone before? No. Yeah. Do you see different um, gut health when people use different kind of diet, like vegetarians, vegans, or gluten-free? Just curious. So, particular, well, th there can be a, a, a slight difference in the microbes that you'll actually have favour up and down. So processed food will change it. What we're interested, though, is the function of it. So a lot of the time then it depends on what nutrients are being supplied by the feed coming in, the nutrients and microbes are changing out. So difference with different sources of protein, different things like soy or milk will actually produce, will be broken down and produce estrogen and other, other sources back and forth. So there are different microbi microbiomes associated with different diets, but it's not necessarily saying that they are better microbiomes back and forth or not. It's a, it's a whole sort of a health outcome. Yeah, I would say that certainly most of the studies that have come out, and you might have heard of the ones of African communities, for example, who have a vastly different um, diet to the Western diet, uh, most of those studies are looking at the types of microbes that are there and I don't think they're going to that functional level. So I think this is pretty new and I don't think there's much information out there about that as all, at all. Yeah. Thank you for a really interesting presentation from both of you. I have a two-part question. The first part is, does gluten exacerbate leaky gut? And the second part is... Um, what is the impact of some of the very commonly prescribed drugs on our bugs? And I'm talking about statins and antidepressants and proton pump inhibitors and diuretics and et cetera. Um, so maybe I can tackle the first part. So it does gluten uh, change the, the uh, exacerbate leaky gut. Um, so we haven't done those kind of experiments in this um, setup. But what we have looked at is, interestingly, another model of autism and um, at a, a, in an aged mouse, um, they have a similar mutation to what I showed you um, today and the gut lining looked just like someone with celiac disease. So that was really interesting to us, but I can't tell you what's going on there and I'd love to do that kind of work. I'll hand back to Ashley. What was the second part of the question? The statements and antidepressants. And antidepressants. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually have done the antidepressant work. We're about to publish it, so I can't say too much about it. Um, but basically what the story is, is that what we know is that TS well, the SSRIs and TCAs do have different modes of action, and they have different effectiveness on male and female populations. One of the things with a lot of this um, animal model work people would do, they'll do it on males because they don't have hormonal changes, and it's a lot easier. We went back and did this on male and female mice. We found that there was a difference of effect on the microbiome of the two different drugs. So one affected the other, and that actually was in alignment then with which of these would actually be more effective in teaching the, treating these different antidepressants. So our question now is, though, is did the drug help with depression that then made it okay for the microbiome to come back, or did the actual drug 
change the microbiome, which to help prevent the depression, sort of the depressive one. So there, there's this sort of big one back and forth. And we had some really interesting ones where two, where the male mice actually would actually change the microbiome, but then when they were off it, it actually came back to what it was previously. Female ones would actually drift and wouldn't come back. And we're trying to understand, well, why does it happen in one, one situation, not the other? What are the drivers of these changes? And what's the feedback to do this? But, but yes, there, there is an effect there. They do, antidepressants do have any, any microbial properties. And so there is actually a drive and a change in the microbiome. Thank you. Coming down this side, yes. What's your opinion and perspective on those companies that offer microbiome testing? Do you think our understanding is mature enough to get accurate results? So one's under FDA investigation, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and as I was saying is that at the moment they, they can give you like percentage chances of stuff, but it's like getting a genome sequence. Telling you've got a 30% chance of this, 10% chance of that. If you're actually a part of study and look over time, it can actually obvious things that can help pick, um, predict and pick out. There's other things though at the moment is me sending a sample to a micro uh, a microbe company. I'll be very dubious that would actually be able to tell me what you know what what it could mean. I think there's also the point that the micro microbial population is changing over the time. So if you send a sample, you've got a snapshot of what you were like that day when you ate your burger. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, what does that mean uh, uh, as well for long term? And then I'm also. If you want to get technical and boring, then when we look at these type of things, is we use a hundred thousand reads to represent a population of several million. We know statistically that is. Do they do ten thousand reads? Do they a hundred thousand reads? Do they do a million reads? What's enough to cover the entire population? Are they only doing sixty? Yes. Are, are they doing the metagenome? Are they doing the actual fungus? There's a whole bunch of work on the virome as well. So it's it's one where it gives you a snapshot, and it's like looking at old photos, and it could be great. And that, that day you were lucky, but, but at the moment I, I wouldn't put too much into it my, myself. I just wanted to know some more about the um, transfer of the mother's microbiome to the child. Um, is, did you say it was movement from the mother's gut into the amniotic fluid? And then that so moves? it's been an interesting one because the embryonic fluid has a microbial population. That microbiome population was more related to the oral microbiome than the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. There is actually some microbe, microbes found in the placenta, but with the placenta is there still hasn't been recovered to be able to grow that. So it doesn't know if the placenta is just DNA that's been broken down as food and getting pa passed as carbohydrate. But it's not like the fecal microbiome, and there is the actual, what the plug is called when you're actually born, that breaks when your water breaks. Uh, I'm useless at the mucosal plug. So when the mucosal plug there is actually acting as a barrier. So at the moment, the question of exactly where this is coming from and how it's being fed in, it's still a bit of a gray area. And there's still arguments back and forth still about, well, is it even true or real? And that's why we had to go through, we had to grow it, we had to show those, we, we could recover it. We actually, because we're working in an abattoir, we're getting waste material, we had to have so many things all over everywhere mm -hmm. to show that this could not possibly a source from the outside. And there's still those ones of actually how it guts in, how you modulate it. It's I mean, the, the controls are amazing. There were controls of the air in the room where the uh, samples were collected. There were swabs onto the sterile uh, uh, cloth on the table. Yeah. Um, the instruments, everything was done. So many controls for the study, yeah. and so that's why it's so amazing. But then what you can also find is that a mother's microbiome can go across to a, a daughter, and the daughter can actually have a changed microbiome if there's a problem there with the next generation. So you can have generational effects as well. So feedback back and forth. Uh, no. Sorry, just... Very quick then, all right. Um, and how representative do you think that is of humans? Like, because using the calf model? Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, so humans are always thought to be sterile, but magically, as soon as you're born and you have your first mucum, suddenly you've got a microbiome. So when you actually go through and my, we, I have a four-year-old and eighteen-month-year-old, and I got banned from talking about microbiome research with the obstetrician because <laughs> apparently we made too many people wait. But it's one of those things that seemed to make sense to people, but no, nobody was actually had evidence yet, or or there were certain groups who were saying no, it's not right. 
Oh, coming down to the front. Uh, yep. uh, have, have other uh, diseases or neurological disorders been looked at in this sort of area? There are some fantastic studies going on in terms of Parkinson's and there's one particular group in the US led by Sarkis Masmanian who's doing some great um, studies. In the Parkinson's study, the one I'm thinking of, there was a mouse model of Parkinson's. They put human Parkinson's poo, so human samples from Parkinson's patients. They had human poo samples from people who don't have Parkinson's. They put them into the mice and the symptoms worsened with the human uh, samples from Parkinson's patients and did not with the uh, controls. This kind of stuff is amazing. That's a paper in Cell. And that group also published a paper looking at an autism model recently. Um, they're, the, they're some of the main yeah. examples. And there's a lot of the um, neurological diseases associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. And you know, well, the mitochondrial dysfunction will get the mitochondrial dysfunction in the enteric nervous system as well. And that will actually cause a change in the microbiome too. So what the feedback mechanism there between them is, is still one of those things of trying to work out what came first. And that's, that's been the really useful thing for me and Elisa is that I always assume the microbiology is important and she's the neurobiologist who can actually then go and look at that side because it's the actual interface that you need to be looking at. Hi, how's it going? Um, my question is in regards to obviously what you talked about earlier, how um, strong the genetic link is with autism. Um, obviously the rates have increased of diagnosis and seeing the traits a lot more common. What is it do you think that is directly linked? Have we always had that strength of genetics or has it been that more gen um, environmental and health factors and other stuff have come into play? Yes, that's a good question. There's been um, quite a few studies done and uh, one done by someone uh, very highly respected in the field, Ingrid Sheffer in this field, um, did a, a nice review uh, not so long ago. And really there's been uh, such an increase in awareness and um, detection and um, uh, also when there's government incentives to assist with um, families who have autism, you also get an increase in diagnoses. So that's the primary reason um, uh, for the numbers, which might seem shocking, but it also, oh, sorry, there's another reason. In the past, you would have grown up and you would have seen these kids in other families that were a bit different, and they were just a bit different. Now they're given a name, and quite often it's autism. Also, other people in, um, so mental retardation, we used to call it, those people, a lot of those people might now be in the autism group. So there's a bit of group changing as well, and that accounts for some of those higher numbers. But do you think the genetics have like always been that strong or do you think that's increased as well or is there more? It's probably always been there. We can't test well enough yet even now. We have some CNV panels, so um, copy number variation panels that people have. We have some SNPs so we can look for those rare mutations, but it's still not great. If you really want to look, you've got to send it to an autism specialist who's a geneticist and they comb through it because they're interested. Otherwise, you can't send it to a company yet, but we'll get there but we're not there yet, so it's too I, difficult to answer that. And I agree with, with the genetics. I don't think there's an increase in the genetics in the population, that that's still there, but it's our understanding and our willingness to embrace and our actually acceptance into society, that's been the big difference. Um, I've got a big question for you. Um, there's obviously an incredible evolutionary connection between the brain and the gut. Which came first? Have they always evolved together or... I'm going to just say, I reckon the microbes were there first. No, <laughs> well, that's it. The microbes were. The microbes are parts of us because they're our mitochondria and the rest. And I just say that they, we've been evolved to find the microbes' food. So that, that evolution came about because that's what the microbes were driving us to do because we had to find food. We had to get all these different ones back and forth. And when you actually start to look, you can actually find these sort of hybrid eukaryotic prokaryotic organisms that have the vacuoles it's it's quite common to sort of have sort of some pseudo um, digestive system that start then starts to evolve communication back and forth i think as we were like a stimulus response type thing i reckon the neuro enteric nervous system evolved first because it was more important like digesting foods more important than looking looking for something so <laughs> unless it's food yeah <laughs> lady in the back row so there's always a lot of advertising around taking probiotics for your health. And um, I suppose, you know, we've all taken antibiotics over our lifetimes and you make the assumption 
um, I'm a healthy person or I must be, you know, something's obviously going to be bad because I took antibiotics. So I should start taking probiotics or I should just take them every day because then I'll always have good health. What are your thoughts on all the advertising around the different types, how many you should take yeah. and is this actually working or should we just buy tats lotto tickets with the money we spend on probiotics? <laughs> Maybe that. It's a really um, unregulated industry. The science is not there. There's basically no science behind it. Eat well, exercise well, in moderation, everything. Common sense sort of answer. What's written on the, on the, on the bottle is, is not what really the, those um, samples do and everybody's different as well. It might be different for one person and another. Yeah, my suggestion, if it makes you happy and you like it, there's no, there's no problem. Clap your hands. Yeah, and th there's no problem in doing it. Your appendix has actually been shown as a reservoir for actually when things go toxic with the actual gut. So I read when we were going around eating dead carrion and stuff and every now and again had to have so bad clear our gut out of everything, the appendix acts as reseeding the microbiome. And there has been some studies that have shown that if you actually do take too strong a doses of some one individual strain, that can actually lead to problems later on because you disrupt that actual reintroduction of your own microbiome. But then there's a lot of other factors around as well. Are you having a healthy diet? Are you doing this? If you're taking the you know, the supplement as a way of being able to go out and do lots of unhealthy things, then no, that's not going to counteract it. But if it makes you happy and you enjoy it, then... But it's like a lot of nutrients and supplements. If you need them for a reason, then yes. But otherwise, you should be able to get it from your diet. So if you're taking supplements, then just because you think, then I would say have a look at your diet and talk to a nutritionist. If you need the supplements for medical reasons, then that's, take them. So sorry, you were saying about your appendix. What happens if you like, have been taking your appendix out? They say it's an old thing, you've got to yep. get rid of the appendix in this. So our model sorry, our just, just for the, uh, the video, that was a question about the appendix being having, a, having a, a microbiome sort of backup system, basically, and what happens if you've lost it. So our modern diet, our modern lifestyle is such now that we never reach a point where we've had to re-eat a rotten carcass to survive and take that risk. So no, none of us anymore are at that sort of stage ultimate death, or if we are, there'll be a whole bunch of other interventions going on. So while we like to think, oh, we're a bit crook, yeah, we were, but we're not at that same level of what evolution had been thinking or setting up for. Now, the last question from the lady here. Thank you. Um, I have a familial and professional connection to autism. Um, my question is around, is there, you know, the thing that flows on from what you're saying here about healthy diet, um, a lot of the people I know who are on the spectrum have very restricted diets um, and often very white diets. So getting, you know, a broad range of colourful vegetables and even green vegetables is, is really problematic. Um, is there any work being done about how we can sort of fill that void, I guess. Yeah, because mm. there's a lot of work that's been done with, like a lot of agricultural work, looking at f f certain fibres, increasing fibres and other food sources, and making sure that you can actually give a good representative diet. So that's what I was saying, is that if it makes you feel good and you're happy and you can, you can eat it, that's completely fine. But we strongly recognise that with certain parts of the population is that's not going to be, it's not as easy just to say, here, just have some spinach. That's why we work with the mouse model at the moment, because... We can control what they eat, we can control what they do, because when we move into a human population, we know it's going to be so varied and, and the rest that, that we need these actually strong markers so we can see through the data and say, yes, the, these still are the strong ones that we actually need to look at. And that's why it's also it's not promising anyone a cure, it's an improvement of lifestyle. Thank you. I'd like to invite Professor David Walker, who's one of our counsellors, to come up and move a vote of thanks to our exceptional speakers. Well, thank you very much. I, I think uh, both of our speakers have fully vindicated the decision that you, this wonderful audience, made tonight to step out on a very cold, wet, windy, dark Thursday night in Melbourne to come and find out why you should be friends with your, back, with your gut bacteria. And I think they've made a very convincing case for that. I, I was interested in the biographies that uh, you, both of you gave because here we've got one speaker who, as a young girl, made a brain out of blue tack 
and then decided that that wasn't enough and there had to be another brain somewhere else and she <laughs> went ahead and discovered it. And then we've got Ashley who was a, a microbiologist and, a, and a, a marine microbiologist and then went to Ireland and worked on sugar beet. And I, was, I keep wondering what might have been fermenting there in, in your mind <laughs> and what might have happened. But here you've come back and you're together and, and I think this is a, a, a really good case is two, where two is better than one, that together you've worked on something and really beginning to reveal some very important issues about how the body works and what goes wrong when one part of it goes wrong and another part has to deal with that and it also goes wrong. So I think the work you've done is, is really enlightening as get, helping us to understand how things develop, how things evolve and how things develop. And so I'd like to ask you, the audience, to join with me in thanking both of these speakers for a very nice talk.